So, so we have a double agenda today, which is one is looking at <clears throat> latest cluster design in the tiny scale. And then um, Bill actually pointed out that these designs start resembling a single chip. Uh, so why not compare with with a single host with the many chip um, with the many chip um, many core chip? And so we'll do just that. But the idea is that we want to keep the the cost low. So. Um, I was just posting the pictures of the assembly on what's got to be everybody's favorite website these days. So let's go find it. Mm. Here, screen share. Screen share. Okay, looks like it works. Mm -hmm. Better than WebEx. All right. So let's go to Bill's favorite website. Okay, so this is the thread for the assembly sequence of the cluster. So the idea for the mini cluster or micro cluster or nano cluster, whatever name you want to give it, is that um, uh, is to use um, uh, Raspberry Pi Zero format boards. But um, Raspberry Pi Zero has uh, only 512 of RAM, whereas the Orange Pi 0-2W, the latest revision, has uh, 512, 1, 2, and 4 as options. So you can have a lot more RAM, which given that after all, we would like to pretend this is, uh, is an MPI setup, um, makes some sense to choose. Uh, I haven't measured um, the watts yet. That's um, that's next on the to-do list. I just uh, booted it a few minutes ago. Um, but I have a kilowatt here, so maybe we can get that done. So <clears throat> for the cluster itself, there are some cases that are made by... Um, uh, this one is from Pi Hut. Uh, let me see. The fact that we're having, we're using two screens should um, come in handy now. Let me see what I can do. Yes. Is that the screen? Yes. <sighs> Excuse me. All right, can you see a second screen? Not really. Let's see. <sighs> yes, all right, you can. So, specs for the two, zero 2W for starts. Same for form factor as the Raspberry Pi Zero. It's an all winner chip. Uh, Cortex A53. And as I was saying, oh, I was wrong. There is no 512 option anymore. It's one gig, one and a half gig, two gigs, and four gigs of LPDDR4. Wi Fi 5. Bluetooth 5, USB 2. And the USB connectors, if you see them up here, are USB C. Um, there is a camera connector over here on the left. And um, there is obviously um, 
um, an SD card or if you haven't paid the licensing fee at TF here on, on the right. And um, very annoyingly up here, um, a mini HDMI, not the micro HDMI, um, like the Raspberry Pi 345, and not um, a standard HDMI like everybody else. The mini HDMI that's hardly used everywhere. So, peek. But, okay, I suppose it makes sense with the size of the board. Um, what else is here on the website? Probably nothing very interesting. Oh, one thing that I wanted to show you. See, am I on camera on one of them? Here on the left, I'm on camera. Um, the, um, the connectors, which on the uh, Pi Zero and on the orange Pi Zero to W, you have to solder yourself. No biggie, but uh, it's a fact of life. Um, these ones are actually, let me see if you can see, color coded, which is super neat. For uh, for the Raspberry Pi, you can order these from some vendors um, so that you can actually tell one GPIO from another. Uh, for the Orange Pi, they come color coded to begin with, which is a nice detail. Um, nice touch. Uh, what else? Don't think that there is a whole lot of different stuff here. There is an LED which I think is um, is um, showing you in red and green the boot status, at least by default. Um, uh, oh, the antenna. Yes, I will show you. Um, in our boards, uh, we have Wi-Fi antenna pre-installed, which will stand out quite a bit. Um, power management unit, we don't care. But on the back, there are 16 me megabytes of SPI NOR flash, which is a neat detail. You can burn your operating system onto that if it's small enough and not deal with the SD card on, or the TF <laughs> being reliable or not. So that's, um, that's nice. Specs wise, GPU is a Mali. Uh, Quad core is 1.5 gigahertz. Uh, USB C is the port, but the standard is USB 2, so don't get too excited there. Um, uh, almost all of the SOC is out through the expansion interface. So see up here. So you can bring out almost any pin of the SOC you may want. And there are images for Android, Debian 11.12, Ubuntu 22.20, and, 20, and Orange Pi OS, which is Arch. And um, that's about it. Not too different for um, the Raspberry Pi. And I um, am curious what the power consumption difference will be, actually. Um, we'll find out. So, are you seeing my screenshots again? No. I need to get back the screen sharing from myself. Uh, what about now? And make sense that only one screen can be sharing at once. No, maybe I need to stop sharing on one and start sharing on the other. Yep. to get this juggling routine down if we're gonna do it a lot. All right, so 
Assembly is pretty straightforward. Some cute rubber standoffs and uh, I'm sorry, some cute rubber bumpers as feet and uh, the standoffs are plastic. So everything is insulated and actually it's nice to assemble because you can do it with your fingers. You don't need to do too much of an effort um, with tools or anything like that. Um, I ordered two of these because I wanted to build a cluster of four, not of um, three, which is the default. So there is quite a bit of hardware laying around here. Um, let me see, I had, um, I had the assembly guide somewhere to show you, but I um, don't think that there is a whole lot of interesting stuff there. Let's see. Oops, this computer has become incredibly slow. There, let's skip that. Um, where is it? Here. Right. Whoa, not right. Let's try again. There we go. This is the case base that I used. I used two of these. Um, Pie Hut is a British store, but uh, their shipping to the US is fairly reasonable. There is another um, store that I forget the name of. Um, US base that has the same case. In the end, I didn't bother and I ordered from Pi Hut. The only part that seems to be a problem is that, as you will see in my assembly, my unit arrived without the fans. So I'm waiting for a second shipment containing the fans. Uh, um, it is quite important that you have fans with these modern SOCs because if you do not have cooling, the SOC will throttle from maximum performance. So what is the point of studying all the specs if you cannot accomplish, if you cannot achieve them, right? So uh, the fans are essential. So that's um, that's an addition once once they arrive in, uh, in the next shipment. But as you can see, uh, it takes about two, it takes about half of the space on each level. Do you use heat sinks? Say again, Bill? Are you using heat sinks on the chip? Uh, by default, it doesn't come with heat sinks, but we can put some heat sinks to make the fans more efficient. My idea was to test with, uh, with the fans and see how far can we get uh, that way. I think it should be sufficient, but uh, we can add heat sinks if needed. I don't think that we can go with heat sinks alone, if that's what you mean. Um, especially not when, um, not when we plan to um, to push this as a as a pretend numerical computation platform, right? Or basically, we're going to be pegging the CPUs all the time. So, uh, hello, my name is Zach. I haven't spoken yet. Yeah. Could you? instead of having several very small fans directly above the processors, could you just have a single like 120 millimeter fan just going up like perpendicular to them on the side and cool yes. all of them with a single fan? Yes, you could. Um, I would imagine see. that would be quieter as well because it could be slower. Oh, that, definitely. Let me see if I can, yes. I usually do this in the lab. Let's see if this still exists. This is uh, a little bit of an old article. Uh, they lost all the pictures, which is exactly what I wanted to show you. Um, let's see if, no, they are broken. Um, right here, no. Huh? 
O'Reilly doesn't allow the the Internet Archive to archive their site. That's not cool. Okay. Well, uh, well, what I wanted to show you is that um, in the lab I tend to do exactly that. So in this article that I'm trying to find, there is uh, there is this board that reaches over a hundred Fahrenheit in the lab, and I have this a big square fan pointed at it. And uh, I have a set of fans like that in the lab where I have a big one, 20 millimeters and two of increasingly smaller sizes, but they are on stands so that I can just plug them onto a USB port anywhere and, uh, and have some cooling. So I think that that would be a, a way to go, but um, I'm trying to make uh, something relatively pretty here. So I'll start with their own fans and see, see what, uh, what the results are. Uh, there is also an option that I think is easier to do on the zero, on the Raspberry Pi zero than on the Orange Pi, which is they have a fan controller, uh, small extension that would fit in there. And if you add the fan controller, you can actually control how fast the fans go. Otherwise, the fans are always uh, pedal to the metal, which is going to make a little bit more of a ruckus. Anyway, so this is standard assembly. You get one on the ground floor, one above, and one on the third floor, and then you're done. But um, I'm trying to combine multiple kits. Uh, so, uh, I want to get to four. So, um, to do that, um, <coughs> I have a problem because if you look here carefully, you can see that the design of these layers is that they have an outer hole, which is the standoffs for the next layer and an inner hole, which is the, stand, the micro standoff for the board. Except on the top uh, level, the original build of these, according to reviews, used to have all boards the same, which kind of enabled what I wanted to do, which is combine kits and make a longer thing. The current version has these special top layers that have fewer holes. And unfortunately, they're not suitable for that. So, um, the obvious thing would be drilling the perspex, which would be an actually interesting challenge to do because it's easy to crack. Um, but it it is going to be a few days before a, a drill bit for a plexiglass or perspex is going to arrive here. So um, that wasn't acceptable for today where I needed to show you the cluster. So instead I did something else, uh, which is exacto knifing my way to success by cutting the standoffs um, threaded part and then using crazy glue. After all, we're dealing with masses that are so low that crazy glue is an acceptable solution. And so there you go, four boards. Um, incidentally, there is one funny thing, which is that Orange Pie seems to put a lot of attention in a lot of things, but not in their packaging. Um, their boxes look all the same, and I have to look at the barcode to figure out what's in there, um, unless I open them. So um, they lack a little bit of personality, but oh well, can't have everything. Um, so... Let me see, there was one more shot, but maybe didn't make it here. And there was one more shot um, that was attempting to show you the powered cluster. Maybe it didn't load. Looks like it didn't. All right, so now um, I can actually show you the thing itself, uh, and I don't know if I came up with the name for this or if it was Bill, but it is a handheld cluster, <laughs> really. It is so tiny that I, I have trouble not breaking things. 
Um, and that would make it a ham fisted cluster. <laughs> yes. If you look here, these have Wi Fi, as we discussed. And so each level has its own antenna. For now, I have parked it next to the board. I think we want something smarter than that um, in the future. But we have the four antennas installed, one for each layer. Um, so everything there is fine. Now, the power is coming through the first one of the USB-Cs. And uh, so the idea here, this one actually came out as, a, as expected, is that as usual, we can, we can go on Alibaba or eBay and found, find splitter cables for any number of anything. So one USB, which happens to be USB B because there is no power management controller here. We're just giving power. And so USB B guarantees that there are no promises. It's just pure voltage. We need to have an adapter because the, um, the power supply that I found that had enough watts, this one has 20 watts, is also USB-C. And then we go USB-C everywhere. So to do that, let's see. Uh, now this is the true test of this of the crazy glue solution because you're pushing pretty hard on the USB-C connector to, to get in and to get out. So far, it has held. I plugged in maybe three or four times, and later removed with no issue. So maybe it's not a completely absurd engineering solution after all. Uh, let me put the secondary laptop out of the way. And here we go. So we want to see the back side here. And the LED that I was mentioning is flashing because apparently there is something on the um, on the um, built-in flash. Okay, preloaded with probably um, probably arch, I, I imagine. So we could try the the watts check here. And uh, hardware-wise, I think that we're getting there. There is the problem of the uh, <clears throat> of the mini HDMI. I, think I have one <coughs> mini HDMI connector at home in the in the parts archive, but I can't get that right now. Um, otherwise, I never ever use those. And so I had to order a, a bunch of them, um, but we don't have them yet. So the, um, the video part is missing in this demo, unfortunately. But the, um, the boards are obviously booting because um, the green light is flashing to show the loading. Um, but unfortunately, we cannot see booting into what. Now, the, the part that uh, is left here is to turn these into a cluster, if you have seen the other demos for the Raspberry Pi clusters, is um, that you need networking and you need stable networking. So <clears throat> the way I solve this in the other Pi clusters is that I use the fact that uh, modern Raspberry Pis have Wi-Fi and uh, um, Ethernet networking, physical networking, by using the physical networking to create a network that is always the same for the cluster. So it's always logically addressable with the same host names, always the same IP addresses. And so the, the MPI code can just say host one, host two, host three, host N by name. 
the IP addresses are always mapped to those names statically. There is no dynamic IP dance that we have to do. And uh, node zero is an NFS share that essentially provides the binary to all nodes so that, um, so that they can execute the code or they can return data if, uh, if they want back into the share. Um, that is a very reasonable setup and it's fairly common setup for parallel computing. To do that here um, is a problem because um, the networking here is Wi-Fi only. So uh, there are two possibilities. One is embrace the Wi-Fi-ness. Um, let me see if I can show you. It's a mother thread. We were discussing these recently. There are a number of small footprint, small footprint routers that are quite cute. Um, if I unplug this, I'm going to lose the connection because you're currently seeing me through this router, so I can't do that. Um, okay. There are smaller ones. Mm, let's see. There are smaller ones, uh, but this one is sort of a high powered one. This is uh, called the Link Star. Um, this has four physical Ethernet connectors, two are 2.5. Um, gigabits and two are one gigabit. There are also USB ports for a variety of reasons because this machine can also be used as a little um, a little network storage um, solution or something to run Android or Linux and put it in the little corner of your office. But here it's just a, a, a router and um, and it's working pretty well. It's actually a um, little concept that I've been working with a little bit uh, lately, which is instead of reconfiguring devices every time I move around, make sure that there is a network that follows me everywhere. So there is um, always this network called base star anywhere I go. And if there isn't, I pull um, a thing like this out of my bag and make the network happen and then everything else connects to it without need of reconfiguration. Now, the reason for the LinkStar being interesting is that the LinkStar is actually high, um, high performance. This will uh, allow me to use the full extent of what a Wi-Fi link would allow, which is already limited, but at least we'll be able to use the whole thing. And there is another one, which I need to get one second. which is this, um, which is an even smaller thing. This one is in my um, work bag. And essentially when, when I want to do what I was describing before, which is bring the network with me, um, I just plug this into a USB and make my usual network happen. Um, this one is not a powerful device. This one will not max Wi-Fi. This will not impress anybody with performance, uh, but it's enough to stream a little bit of video uh, across it. If you're in a hotel room and you want to watch Disney or Netflix or what have you, and, uh, and it will bring the rest of the network um, reasonably in shape. So um, also because it's so tiny, it's kind of the right size for this. So that's what I'm leaning towards. However, here is the problem. Um, if I wire this entire thing using Wi-Fi, uh, using a single network, um, the, the, the layout will not be clean the way I want it to be. So 
The Mango can support multiple networks. So one solution could be quite simply um, spawn two Wi-Fi networks. Um, or rather, <clears throat> spawn one for locality, which is um, just going to hand out consistently the same static IP addresses to the same boards. So we can do the same labeling uh, trick that I did before of just static host names. And, and there you go. Uh, and then route through the Mango to get, get to use the Mango as a gateway, essentially, so that you can get to the outside world and install packages or bring in whatever bits of code or whatever you need to actually use the cluster. That would be an idea. Um, and it's the most likely one uh, to finish this cluster. The other possibility is that as someone has pointed out, <clears throat> maybe with USB-C, one could try to build a network uh, straight off of USB-C without, without dongles, just the connecting uh, USB-C second port to some kind, kind of switch and do some direct networking that way. I haven't seen the hardware to do this. Uh, I haven't really researched this at length either. Uh, but given that USB-C is such a carrier for other protocols, I'm not ruling it out. Um, I suppose it's worth some Googling <laughs> to see if this can be done without, without four dongles to go to Ethernet and then um, and then doing it with the Ethernet. Um, anyway, that's the um, that's the way this looks like. Um, the the soft once we figure out what the what the network configuration looks like, the software stage will look exactly the same as what we have seen in the other clusters. So nothing too surprising there. There is there is no need to change um, anything. Now, let me hop on the other scenario, which is uh, the one that um, uh, that Bill was mentioning. Uh, the OK, so you have 16 cores here. I used to have 16 cores on <laughs> um, a data center chip 10 years ago. So what's the deal? <clears throat> Obviously, the kind of the purpose of this cluster is to have a small teaching or learning environment for MPI or or uh, similar interfaces. It's not to um, break any speed record. Uh, but what if we just did that with um, with old hardware instead of um, instead of uh, of new uh, goodness? So co the cost of this cluster, let's see. The two cases were about uh, 15, let's say they were about $20. Um, power supply and cables, probably another $20. And uh, the boards themselves are around $15 each. So we're looking at essentially $100 for this cluster. It's not bad. Um, usually I would throw in um, uh, a case so that we don't bump it around like um, um, I forget what they're called right now. Um, there are black plastic cases that are popular with uh, tool owners and gun owners. You can find them. Pelican. Say again? Pelican. Pelican, yes, that's right. Pelican is the brand name. There are all sort of cheaper knockoffs. Um, cheaper knockoff brand that I like is uh, carried by Harbor Freight. Uh, I haven't carried one out yet, but for the bigger clusters, I have the medium size one works perfectly well. The smallest size should work just fine for this. Like and last year, Ocean State job lot. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, that, that either I forget if they were authentic or knockoffs, but might be better than uh, Harbor Freight stuff that fell off a container ship. <laughs> but the the part that matters here is that these teeny tiny clusters are fun to build, but they're not fun when they break. So 
when you're using them, you want them to be reliable. And uh, the Pelican cases, uh, whether they are knockoffs or not, are a great solution for that. <clears throat> I've carried two of these uh, cross country on a plane, just in the Pelican cases in the overhead bin, perfectly fine. Uh, given demos at scale, brought them back, no, no problem whatsoever. Um, I've carried much more expensive de hardware designed for travel, literally things that were cost ten to twenty thousand dollars that they couldn't take. Um, they couldn't take the overhead bin travel. So, um, yay for small clusters in Pelican cases. I, I would say in terms of reliability, but the Pelican case is not optional. Um, is my point here. Now, um, I am going to use um, the phone. Well, we're going to do some a bit of both. Let's do, let's use a second computer. Where is it? Uh, 02W. Here. And okay, so we learned that the way to do this is stop the share over here, start the share over here. Uh, yes. I see myself everywhere. That's not okay. So, what is the alternative? The alternative is um, 10 year old hardware. And uh, this is not going to be $100. This is going to be more like $600. Um, I write for Linux New Media, uh, a column called uh, Performance Tuning Dojo, about every month or so. Um, if you look at next month's column, there is basically a build out done with this. Um, and the price that we managed to keep under was 600. So um, I essentially got the Dell workstation from 2013 uh, off of eBay. It was relatively good shape it has all major interfaces and more than i need frankly and um and it was around 150 dollars let me see if i have the the exact picture here here is the inside so this is as it arrived so the board was promised working no cpus only one fan uh, no shrouds were promised. It actually came in pretty good shape. Um, I had another fan block in my archive, which is great because computer cost $150 if I needed to order another fan block to have doubled the price, um, broken the project. Uh, and the shrouds, similarly, you don't want to order parts from Dell um, brand new, so uh, it's great that those were there. There still were other interesting problems, but the start was good. So then, how many cores can we put in there? There is a uh, Xeon E5 uh, <coughs> with 22 cores that is compatible with this board after BIOS upgrade. So I put in, um, I think, a 10 core chip that I had in the lab, flashed uh, the BIOS to the newest, uh, latest, and greatest. I have to say that actually the Dell tools for flashing are really nice these days. Um, if you if you know what you're doing in terms of setting them up, they um, they get you there quite, rather quickly. So I got the latest uh, flash in there. I didn't brick anything, and then I could get the the 22 um, core chips in. Now, the 22 core chips, as you can imagine, are expensive even when they're used, even when they're um, not um, brand new. 
So what I did is that I found two engineering samples on eBay. Um, engineering samples are not the most reliable, but uh, these pass all tests, so they're reliable enough for me. Um, also, engineering samples usually don't reach the maximum speed. This this uh, CPU is rated at, I believe, 2.1 or 2.3 um, uh, yeah, you can see it here. So the spec is 2.1 for the engineering sample. The production of this chip actually was higher. I think it was 2.2 or 2.3. So the engineering sample is a little bit slower, but interestingly, the core speed down here for core zero, so the turbo speed goes to 2.4, which is the maximum speed that this chip can reach uh, even in the production one. So the turbo is the same, but the, the spec is lower, a little bit. The part that is different is, um, I think there is a 0.1 difference between the maximum turbo that can be applied to all cores, which is actually what happened, what, what matters to us. I think that the production one can go to uh, 2.3, if I remember correctly, maybe. Uh, I know that these can go to 2.2 and that's it. So they can only turbo a little bit. Um, but <clears throat> since we're planning to run all of them pedal to the metal, the turbo doesn't matter too much to us. The two chips um, were um, 200 and something. Well, you'll, you'll need to read the article if you want the exact budgetary quote, but it was, it was a little bit more than $200. And, um, and they work fine. The part that wasn't fine was that once the chips arrived, I discovered, I discovered, what did I discover? Where is the picture? Uh, here. That socket one had a bent pin. And um, this did not manifest itself as broken, no socket one at all. It manifested itself as one of the RAM lines did not work. So um, uh, we want to max out the RAM or get close to max. And so I'm putting a lot in a lot of a lot of dims to fill all slots. And when I fill all slots, the system doesn't work. So <clears throat> for some reason, I'm convinced it's a RAM problem. I think it's the messages that I'm getting either from the beeps in the BIOS or the screen, I don't remember anymore. So I bisect the problem. I put in half of the RAM, does it work? Yes. I put in the other half of the RAM, does it work? Yes. Uh, actually, no. <laughs> okay. So um, the problem is in the second half. I swapped the, the chips to check if the chips are fine, the chips are fine. So the problem is with the motherboard. Then I keep bisecting the part that didn't work until I find that there are two dim slots that are causing a problem. But as I clean the slots, they seem perfectly fine to me. I don't see anything wrong anywhere. And then um, I was doing something, uh, reseating the CPUs for some reason. And when I did that, I noticed that there was some uh, thermal paste in the socket, which is a no-no because mm, it's either insulation that you don't want, or it's conductive and you don't want it that either. And uh, in any case, it's in some case in some way um, not ideal for the pins to be in that so solution. So needed to get that out. This obviously is not a system that you can return under warranty. So I, what I did was that I went to Alibaba again and got uh, a water pick. One of these things that you use to power wash your teeth uh, with high pressure water. It's like a flossing device. Um, I loaded that with isopropyl alcohol 90%. And um, the reason why I did this on Alibaba was that the device obviously is going to get destroyed. All the seals are not designed to take IPA 90%. Uh, this is a one-time use of the device. 
Uh, but blasting I, high pressure IPA, I was able to remove the the thermal paste with no damage. And then I, over Christmas, I spent quite a bit of time using an, an index card, um, basically light cardboard and tweezers stra straightening this pin until it was in line with the others. And, um, and that's... Uh, Federico, you're muted. Sorry, um, accidentally muted. Can you hear me? Yes, I assumed you were just swearing. <laughs> I should have. I was just saying that that's how you fix the socket. Uh, it pro provided me some entertainment over Christmas. I'll put it that way. Um, so once it's running, it looks like this. And you wonder, why are cores 32 and 33 doing all the work? And that is basically the the curse of the single threaded benchmarks. I guess, benchmark, I guess. Uh, this is just Ubuntu. I think it's twenty um, three ten, if I remember. Um, and yeah, it's perfectly happy using two cores, but everything is working now. And then the other thing is um, when you do a little bit of stress test. Um, where can you bring things? So when the system is cool, the temperature is around 55 centigrades. Um, when you do the stress test, the part that matters to me is the power, and this is going to be the difference. When you load all cores, we're going to go from 120 watts to 317. And um, the system is running at its maximum speed. So we're not running into problems like um, this is an office. So in an office, you have cubicle power limits. <laughs> you're, you're not going to pull four amps from a cubicle plug. We're not, um, we're not going that far. So we're fine. Um, and Dell obviously did a good job with the, with the fans because um, None of the chips went over 60. Actually, no, I'm mistaken. There is a 72 on the outside of the CPU, but uh, none of the cores went over 60. So pretty good. Congratulations to Dell's thermal engineers. And um, I don't think I have any other pictures there. Uh, let me see. It's the preprint of no, that's it. Okay. So, oh, I forgot to tell you the important part. So, um, we have 44 cores in this guy. Great. We have 250 uh, gigabytes of RAM. So, that comes to about six gigs of RAM per core. Um, this is not a toy. <laughs> um, here you can actually run an MPI model that has one core every six uh, gigs of data and, um, and do some serious damage with it. Um, so it's 10 years old hardware and it's $600. And I think it's a reasonable choice also. Um, additionally, if your model was really data hungry, which mine are not, but yours may be, um, uh, with DDR4, you could double this RAM. So if you, if you put in another, I think $500, you could probably get to, you should be able to get to 512 gigs of RAM by replacing all the RAM with, uh, with uh, larger modules. And then there is the ultimate option, which is get it to one terabyte of RAM, which will cost about um, 
I think it will cost around two thousand dollars using LP DDR4. So if there is a problem that needs that kind of of memory space, um, the system can be expanded to accommodate that. I um, the the things that I model um, for fun don't have that kind of uh, super extensive data pool, so that's that's fine for me. Um, let me see. Um, I think that's it for the system virtually. I can bring the camera over and show you the system in in the cubicle where it's set up. But I think that you essentially have seen everything that there is to see about it. I'm thinking um, I can power it up and run an actual MPI benchmark there. Um, but I'll just give you the, the punchline. So um, obviously, we haven't run an MPI benchmark on the little guy over here yet. But um, last time we spoke about these clusters, we had the benchmarks for the Raspberry Pi 4 cluster with three nodes. That was four, eight, 12 cores. Um, right. That was 12 cores, not 44 uh, like the um, like the Xeon has. If you compare uh, core to core, so if you normalize by the number of cores, comparing the Xeon to the Raspberry Pi 4 cluster, so the Xeon no cluster, I call it, because it's just one node, but it's MPI. You're programming MPI over 44 cores. <coughs> The Xeon no cluster is uh, apples to apples. So comparing cores on equal footing, it's about three times faster than the Raspberry Pi 4 uh, cores. And the reason for that is pretty obviously that, uh, well, leaving aside the fact that it's a Xeon, so it's a lot beefier processor. The real reason is the network, right? The Xeon is going over its internal interconnect. Its network is local host. <laughs> it's never hitting the wire. Uh, for the Raspberry Pi, we're actually on the wire. We are with one gigabit network that is bridged by USB on, on the four. So it's not even full spec, one gigabit. So that's, that's obviously slowing it down. That's the dominant factor in seeing that uh, the Pi cluster core per core is three times slower. Now, um, if you don't do it apples to apples, if you do it machine to machine, um, the Xeon is a monster. It's about a hundred times faster than the Raspberry Pi cluster. But uh, this is not a race, obviously. Um, it's nice that we can run bigger models over there, uh, but if we're just using it as a teaching instrument, um, the, the Xeon is actually something that I lugged from my office over to a cubicle before we started because I didn't want to um, do weight lifting during the talk here. <laughs> so um, it is <clears throat> not something made for moving. It is an under the desk workstation, but it looks like something that belongs on a rack. Um, so the Raspberry Pi clusters have a very big asset in terms of being much more mobile, much more light, um, much more cost effective when something breaks. And um, uh, by the way, the 100 faster on the Xeon was not hyperbole. It's literally 100 times faster um, in my benchmark. Okay, um, that's it. I think I saw either a comment or a raised hand or both. Let's see. I see John has raised hand. Yes. Um, wouldn't you use something like OpenMP on a Xeon instead of MPI? Because OpenMP was specifically made for multi-core systems, you know, on the same memory and stuff like that, versus MPI being more for different systems spread out, like the Raspberry Pi. Yeah, you're probably right. 
I, I'm basically try to use the same tools everywhere to compare, but um, on a on a single system, there are faster things that you can do than um, than being silly and using MPI. Yes. Well, I mean, one of the things that you you <clears> might <throat> want to show or teach your students is actually using both of them in developing applications. So because as soon as you go from one system to the other, you have the, all the issues of latency and things like that. Right. And, um, but I, I think it's important to get students to understand where is the right place to use the right tools in order to be able to get the maximum throughput. Yes. Um, there is only so much that you can realistically teach uh, <clears throat> in, um, in the time you have, but, um, there is a little bit of room when you give people projects, right? You can send them in different directions and let them try different things. If you try to teach people parallel programming, the biggest problem with these old C-based tools is that uh, they are an abomination um, against C, against C++. It doesn't matter where you're coming from. You look at the MPI syntax and you go, what is going on here? Um, <coughs> and you have to just accept that it's this weird wacko thingy that somebody decided works this way and fine, you're going to do it that way. Um, but people have to get over that and not from being um, um, systems uh, programming magicians like Jerry, but basically newbies of C or C++. So it's, it's a big pill to swallow. And then you have to get them to accept things like the fact that the network is not instantaneous amdahl's law and all that actually by the way there is a very nice thing that uh, shows up I, I mean it's not nice but it's a cool example that shows up between the raspberry pi 3 cluster and the raspberry pi 4 cluster which is that um if you measure the network impact on performance on the Raspberry Pi 3 cluster by, let's say, you write your code and you run it four cores on the same board and you get local results. And then you do four cores on different boards and you get results over network, obviously slower. Um, you do the same test on the Raspberry Pi 4 the gap will be bigger because um, the Raspberry Pi 4 chip is faster more than the Raspberry Pi 4 network is faster, oh, which, but, you know, um, which is a little bit unexpected. <laughs> yeah, Ed, Ed pointed out a couple minutes ago that your uh, it looks like your battery and your Mac is getting pretty low. You might want to plug it in. Oh, yes. But I think we don't need, uh, we don't need that secondary camera anymore. No. But yes, good point. Thank you for saving it before it has some horrible shutdown. This Mac is a little bit old, <laughs> as you can tell from various cracks. It needs a deserved retirement, but it hasn't earned it yet. It's still the go-to machine to run around with around here. <coughs> but I had to join using um, using um, Chrome because the version of Safari on, on that is so old that uh, Jitsi refused to run on it. Let's see. Where are there are any other questions? Well, somebody else had a question before me. They had their hand raised, but I think they took it down. I'll make another comment. So I understand, okay, if you're giving this a course and people using C or C++ and doing the programming and stuff, you don't want to necessarily force them into doing looking at OpenMP versus MPI, but you could at least mention the concepts to them. And oh, maybe yeah. they choose one or the other 
And the other thing is, if I was doing a really parallel process, you know, program, I, I, I wouldn't use C or C++. <laughs> I'd probably go for something like Pascal or, you know, some other type of more modern language, which, which something handles Scala. A, a lot better. Yeah. Yeah. Probably, yes. But it's um, that is also another interesting question because it's, it's a little bit of a balance between what um, what are they going to face? So when when um, when I used to teach at BU, um, I remarked exactly what you said. It was like this is '90s technology. How about we switch decades? Um, let's teach them some newer language. Um, I wanted to teach Python. Um, they wanted me to teach C plus plus. So obviously, I taught C plus plus, but um, the part that was logical of that was that they believed that the students in that course were going to face uh, not C++ really, but C more um, or worse, maybe Fortran when <laughs> they entered the working world because they were all meant to be scientists. So the idea was they're going to deal with old codes. It's all going to be old junk and they need to deal with that. Um, I think for parallel codes, there is a similar thing. A lot of the parallel stuff out there is is far from modern. But um, I agree with you. When when I have fun and I write something, uh, one of those models that I was describing, I uh, write them in processing. I don't care. <laughs> um, initially, I write the thing in processing because I want to see the visualization stage of what is that I'm computing, and um, and then if I decide that I'm going to make things fast. I replace the computing stage with uh, with C++ and I do the distributed stuff there. But I have the front end in processing that can still can still visualize the data. My my original work is still is still useful. So my answer back to these people to say, oh, when they get out in the real world, they're going to be using C or they're going to be using Fortran or they're going to be. It's the same thing as the people who say, well, we can't teach using LibreOffice because <laughs> everybody uses Microsoft Office, right? And I say, what are you teaching? Because every time that Microsoft changes Microsoft Office, <laughs> yes, you know, are you going to send them back to get their degree over again? You know, I'm, I'm still you having trouble when, when my wife hands me her laptop. She has the latest versions of Office. I... Um, I can deal with Office in the in the tens or twenties versions. I I cannot read the the menu bars or the cool bars or whatever they're called. I'm I'm expecting Office two thousand three, <laughs> so it's um it's really a little bit of a shock every time my wife gives me a, a Microsoft Office laptop. But the point is, if you were going to be using that day after day. And using that across a wide range of, 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 of projects, how long would it take you to be able to learn every little nit that you had to learn in Microsoft? Okay. Yeah. Maybe a day or two if you really studied it. All right. The same thing goes with this. It's better for the students to learn the fundamental underlying stuff. And if they have to learn a new language in the future, I'm sorry. <laughs> you're telling me that your students are too stupid to be able to pick up a manual in a language after they've had five or six different languages and, and learn that language. They're too stupid to do that, yet they're smart enough to be able to do AI. You can't have it both ways. They're either smart or they're stupid. <laughs> this, this, is is why the this is why the Survey of Languages course is possibly the most important course in the degree uh, train students to pick up a language quickly there is uh, by the way on that um uh let me see what's the name of this publisher i think it's uh pragmatic programmers isn't it yeah i think so um they have two books that are surveys of weird languages which are highly entertaining and not very useful <laughs> And um, I saw on the website uh, over the holidays that there is a third one coming. So 
third uh, third volume of strange languages that you can read one chapter and get familiar with with one more language it seemed seemed interesting i took one of those courses back in 1973 and what i learned from that course the most important thing was that apl is a write only language <laughs> After you've written it, you can never read it. You can never change it and stay away from, from APL at all costs. Unless you want to use it like a hand calculator. Fine. Or if you live in it uh, or if you live in it six hours a day uh, and write better than average code. So, all right, now you've invited me to tell the story I always <laughs> tell when it comes to APL. I'm trying to make it brief. We, in that course, we took a 40-line Fortran program and reduced it into the smallest lines of APL we could. Most of the students got it down to three lines. A couple got it down to two. And only one student was able to get it down to one line. We typed in the data. Came out the the right you know the right answer, and then the professor with this gleam in his eye turned to the student and said, "Okay, can you explain to us how it works?" And the <laughs> student could not. You're right. And the professor said, "When did you finish this?" He said, "About three hours ago." So, <laughs> yeah, maybe you, if you work with it twenty four hours a day, you know, seven days a week for thirty years, maybe you can decipher it. But that's not who you're writing the code for. Yeah, because because when, you, when you die, nobody's going to be able to change it. Yeah, Mad Dog, yes, the sir. game of golf is the <laughs> problem there, not APL. You play golf in any language. You write the worst code possible in order to get the best golf score. Golf was a mistake in APL. Golf was a mistake in Perl. Showing it to people outside the community was an even greater mistake. But people that do APL professionally do not golf. I think the part that that these uh, these and some other skills are interesting for these days are that some surprisingly you can still make a good living as a mainframe programmer or a COBOL programmer, or any of these items where there is a very limited supply of expertise. And the uh, colleges have given up training those positions. But wait, the, the, the punchline is that, um, according to some in my team, um, managing VMware hypervisors is joining that group now. Could be. So, Mainframe still the best in original cloud. In that same course, that same course where we had seven or eight different languages, one of my coworkers, you know, wrote a program that part of it was in PL1, part of it was in COBOL, part of it was in Fortran, part of it was in uh, IBM assembler language. I forget he used, uh, oh, part of it was in Snowball. And, oh, wow. And he and in a team in in a in a company with four thousand programmers, only he and I knew all of those languages. And so I turned to him and said, "Why did you write these languages?" He says, "Because I was taking this course, <laughs> and every yep. single part, every time I wrote a new part of the program, I'd write it in the language that I was taking in that course." Yep. I said, "I said congratulations." You're going to be fired next week. <laughs> and he was. <laughs> Oops. I, I think you may be the only living snowball programmer I've met. That may be the only only language I missed. Yeah, we snowball have no syntax errors except lack of an end statement. Everything else would at least compile. If the old joke was you could take an ice pick uh, to a punch card. And it was a valid snowball program. <laughs> you could take Scrabble dice and throw them on the table and stick the words E and D at the end of it, and it was a valid snowball program. Yeah, we had uh, a program 
that I found hard to read. It was COBOL program in Burroughs COBOL written by a Fortran programmer who hated COBOL. <laughs> so it was actually Fortran written in COBOL. I uh, looked at a famous programmer's C program that he wanted help with. And I looked at it and said, was your first language Fortran? <laughs> yeah. That was mine. Fortran 2. I think you're the only other Fortran 2 user I've ever met. Nope, you met one here. I'm not surprised. <laughs> yeah, I, I knew basic and Fortran before uh, I went in the Army. Yeah, Fortran was my first real language, too. Of course, I did basic before that in high school. My first year in college, I started with Fortran. Yeah, but you could do Fortran, Fortran 2, Fortran 4, Fortran 77, Fortran 90, high-performance Fortran. You know, it just keeps going. Well, I learned that they were doing uh, Fortran 77. I don't know what numerical codes will look like in another three decades, but they'll call it Fortran. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. Probably. We used to say it we used to say at Bell Labs, we don't know what the next operating system will be, but we bet it will be called Unix. And we were only a few letters off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of which, I've always been curious about Plan Nine. I read about it ages ago, but I've never actually seen it in action. <sighs> okay. I talked with Dennis and Ken about Plan Nine. And their thing was, we're creating a new operating system and we're correcting all the problems that are in Unix. And I said, is there going to be any type of compatibility with Unix? And they said, no. And I said, it's not going to go anyplace because people are tired of rewriting their programs. And that's what happened from my viewpoint. And, and in a sense, you're both right. That was the only way to fix all the problems and aside from the portability problem. Well, Michael Stonebreaker feels that the way to fix all those problems is to write an entire operating system in SQL. <laughs> well, it works well, for him. Gary, but he gave a talk down there at MIT a couple of weeks ago on exactly that. Yeah, but there's so many different varieties of SQL. I got Oracle, Postgres, uh, what's the new one? Uh, MariaDB, used to be uh, my no, no, But you're naming, you're naming operating systems or distributions or, or, or products. You're not named, it's, it's not SQL, which is the standard. Nobody implements the standard. <laughs> Michael did. Every time I need to do date calculations, every SQL database does it differently. Correct. Where, uh, in which venue was uh, Stonebreaker's talk? I didn't know about this one. He gave it in the Gates building at, uh, at the sale. Uh, I don't know what the name of the room is, but it was uh, in, this, in the part that was part of the sale uh, branch there. So it was, it was a, it was a computer it. science uh, it was a computer science event. Yeah, I guess so. Well, it was it was sponsored by the ACM. Oh, there uh, we go. There. Understood. He didn't have very nice things to say about Linux. <laughs> well, um, we used to have this T-shirt that said "O underscore ponies." referring to what database designers wanted from from the kernel oh, 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 oh that's good i i may be old-fashioned i remember when sql had vowels in it <laughs> <Yeah>. <clears throat> um, well when i was a product manager for the ultrix system at digital of course i was based on berkeley 4.1c um at that time the ingress corporation 
would do their development for Ingress on VMS, and then they would put it over to these 160 different Unix systems by using <laughs> compatibility libraries. And that was back in the day when most databases only wrote to raw blocks. You know, they didn't use the mm. file system, uh, particularly on Unix. And part of the reason for that was that by going through the buffer, you were never really sure when the data was actually solidly on the disk. Right. So, in, in, so we made a deal to embed the Ingress database engine into every, every single copy of our operating system for free. And, uh, and basically, this, this took the usage of database engines from 4% on Unix systems, and that 4% was spread between Oracle and Informix. And, and so basically, they got about 1% of the market but for Ingress, we bumped it up to 100% of the market mm -hmm. using the Ingress database engine if they wanted to. Because to, to buy it as a separate product, it was $100,000 on a, on a decent-sized server. And one day I talked to them. I said, why do you think that VMS is so much better than Unix? And they go, oh, we actually wrote a white paper talking about all the reasons why VMS is better than Unix. I says, well, give me a copy of that. Okay. So they gave me a copy of it, and the things that they were talking about was good thread control, um, synchronous writes to the disk, so you knew when the data was there, uh, M uh, mapped memory and stuff. And I'm looking at these 11 reasons. I said, all 11 of these are, are used but they're are available, but they're in POSIX real-time extensions. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is install the POSIX real-time extensions and every single one of those 11 reasons why you think that VMS is better than Unix are fixed. And the English people said, oh, my God. And, and, and Digital actually shipped those extensions as part of our operating system for free but we didn't install them. The, 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 the customer had to ask for them to be installed when they were installing the system. So Ingress then specified these as necessary for their database engine, and they were able to strip out all those compatibility libraries and just use the POSIX extensions. Nice. I, yeah. I do remember your... Uh, your operating system with uh, some fondness. <laughs> you know, I almost, I almost inherited a, an Ultrix system when I was in college because the, the system administrator was retiring it, so he wanted to make it into the um, the student com the student uh, organization's computer. We didn't have the time to set it up, but that was the plan. It was, it was funny because I went out to University of California, Berkeley, and when they were talking about the students' computers, the undergraduate students' computers, I thought they'd be running BSD. They were running mm -hmm. Ultrix. I said, why aren't you running BSD? It's the one that you guys are developing. They said, yeah, but the, the undergraduate students need their computers to stay up. And Ultrix stays up. BSD keeps crashing because they're 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 too busy putting in Developing. new features and stuff to make it stable. <laughs> of course. Yeah, you, you need a stable platform for people that are doing work other than developing the platform. 